Madeira is a Portuguese island off the coast of Morocco. Today, it's a tourist destination. But in the mid-1800s, it was the site of what many church historians have referred to as the most remarkable event in missions history. Madeira was settled by the Portuguese in the the 1400s, discovered by explorers, and they began a a Portuguese colony there in the early 1400s. For 400 years, from the 1400s until the 1800s, there were two populations there, the Portuguese and the Madeirans, and they lived side by side with their own language, but they were unified in their, their Catholic faith. When the Portuguese set up the island as a, a Portuguese colony, they put as the administrator of the island a Catholic bishop, who is really the government and the Portuguese presence there all in one. And for 400 years, reading of the scriptures was banned for 400 years, baptisms outside the Catholic church were banned for 400 years, ma- participation in the Catholic mass was compulsory. For 400 years, any religious meetings of any kind outside of the Catholic Church were prohibited on the island for the, the Madeirans and the Portuguese alike. By the 1800s, these rules were fastidious, and the result was that the Madeirans were all Catholics going back four centuries. To give you some perspective here, the United States is 235 years old. Almost twice as long as that, Madeira was a Portuguese colony that was entirely Catholic by law. Yet, in the 1800s, the Bible wasn't in the Madeiran language. The Portuguese Bible was never seen on the island. The Madeirans themselves were only in the Catholic Church for weddings and funerals, which is about how the Portuguese were as well. But in the mid-1800s, all that changed. Two men came to Madeira. One, Robert Reed Cayley, was a doctor. He was a renowned doctor in London, famous for his advances in in medicine, the treatment of, of diseases. He decided to be a missionary, soundly converted, and went to Madeira. He brought with him William Hewiston, who was a pastor, a young guy, a valedictorian from from Oxford in London, a Scottish guy who had his desire to be a pastor, renowned all over England for his elocution and his oratory skills, which in the pre-TV age was important. Famous throughout the English-speaking world, yet as a young man, he couldn't find a church that would hire him because he he was sickly. It was rumored that he had tuberculosis and that going to a Mediterranean island would help him. So he joined with Cayley. Houston and Cayley together went to Madeira. What happened there over the next four years is really almost unparalleled in, in church history. They started medicine clinics that came, became hospitals. They started literacy programs, which became schools. And soon illnesses were being uh, pushed back from Madeira. People could read and write. The Madeiran language was t- translated into the, the Bible, became available in their their language, all of this over the course of just a few years. One approach to their missions work that made them so effective is that they trained up Madarans themselves to be the leaders of the church. Cayley was a doctor. He had no desire to be a pastor. He was, couldn't pastor the whole island. And he quickly realized that because of his own health, he needed Madarans to take over when he was gone. And soon there was revival breaking out on this island. Well, news of this reached the, uh, the ears of the Portuguese government in Portugal, and they summoned the the bishop there and demanded that he put an end to it. And the bishop refused because he himself had been treated at one of these medical clinics. So the Portuguese government recalled the bishop and replaced him with a bishop who was more to their liking, who made it his goal to, to end the advance of the gospel on the island. He closed most of the schools, closed most of the health clinics, burned the scriptures that were in the Madeiran language, arrested Christians, persecuted them. In a matter of weeks, the situation grew grave. Houston, the younger of the two, fled with both of their wives. He and Kaylee were both married. Houston took both of the wives back to England to escape, leaving Kaylee there to manage the affairs of the church. He survived only a few days uh, in freedom before the government finally arrested him and put him in, in jail. He was expected to die in jail, but within a month he was released, largely because some of the jailers were converted to Christ through his his witness. He was able to minister on the island for another year as the gospel continued to go forward. But towards the end of that fourth year there, he made what would become a fatal mistake for others. He escaped with his life. Uh, He introduced the Bible in Portuguese to the island. And people who spoke Portuguese began to read the the scriptures. And they too began to be converted and come to faith in, in Christ. And on the island, as you can imagine, it's typical in this kind of situation. The Portuguese and the Madeirans, they existed peacefully, but the Portuguese looked down at the Madeirans. There was very much prejudice there, but these Portuguese people, and some of them were quite renowned. Some of them were wealthy Portuguese that were coming to faith in Christ, started attending churches that were pastored by poor Madeirans. 
And that became the status quo on the island, but only for a few months before the rage of the Catholic Church was focused on the islands. The bishop began arresting Christians, confiscating their houses. He closed what few hospitals remained, would confiscate their houses, steal all the goods from inside of the houses where Christians were, burn them to the ground. It was rumored that a church was meeting in a house. He would arrest the entire family that lived in the house as a way to stamp out the church. They were put on these really sham trials. These people were arrested and they were asked if they would participate in the Catholic Mass. Of course, having come to faith in Christ, they would refuse and then they were, were executed. The hunt was on for, for Kaylee. He was the, the real object of this inquisition. And soon, the, like I said, the situation spiraled out of control on this island. It was followed by rooting and, uh, rioting and, and looting as people were hunting for Kaylee. Well, a British vessel happened, a merchant ship happened to dock at the shore there and saw the riots and the out of control nature of the entire island. I mean, the whole island plunged into chaos and came across Cayley and smuggled him out of the island in a disguise, historians tell us. Cayley was a rather rotund individual with a long white Santa Claus-esque beard, so I'm not sure what kind of disguise they were able to, to do, but they got him into the boat and smuggled him off the, the island. When the uh, bishop heard that he had been thwarted, he rounded up all the Christians on the island, everybody who named the name of the Lord, and put them on a boat and expelled them all from the island permanently for Trinidad, eradicating the gospel witness from the island. When I read the passage that we just read this morning, I'm always reminded of that event from church history. Jesus came to his own people. He came healing and teaching. That's what he did. That's all he did in the Gospel of Mark. He healed people and he taught people the gospel. And yet he was driven out of Israel. He was expelled from from Israel, essentially. Mark, we're at a crossroads in the book of Mark here. Mark is not does not unfold chronologically like some of the other Gospels. Mark unfolds geographically. In the brief outline of Mark, it starts with Jesus' baptism in the wilderness and then follows Jesus to Galilee where he sets up shop. You see his interaction with his opponents, the Pharisees and his family, even in Mark 2 and 3. And then it focuses on the miracles of Jesus and the profound impact of his teaching in Mark 4 and 5. You know, the the teaching of the sower and the seed, the stopping of the wind and the waves, the healing of the demoniac, the healing of Jairus' daughter raised back to life from the dead, the healing of the, the woman with blood. And from there, there's a transition to where Jesus is sending out the 12 to Israel. You see him rejected at Nazareth. You see the 12 returning with, with incredible stories of their ministry. John the Baptist is executed. And then all of Israel wants to make Jesus their king. And we looked at that last week, when he, two weeks ago, when he fed them. And then he crossed over, walking on the water. And his goal here, he's going to do a few more weeks of ministry on the opposite side of the, the lake. We're going to see that here summarized. We read about that. And from there, he's going to leave Israel never to return until he's ready to die. He's going to spend the rest of his ministry, the last several months of his ministry in Gentile territory. He's, he's done with Israel. Luke records on his way out, he told the disciples, or he told the Israelites they would receive no more signs except the sign of Jonah when he was crucified and raised from the dead on the third day. And John, it tells him when he told him that, John tells us when he told him that, everybody left him. Everybody left him except the disciples and they made their way out of the lands, never to return until the Mount of Transfiguration where they They see Jesus transformed in his glory, and then from there, Jesus walks a straight line to the cross. This is the crossroads here. He's leaving Israel, expelled by his own people. As we read this passage, I hope you saw the two groups of people, two very different groups of people, the the average Israelite here and the religious leaders of Israel, the people that were flocking to him in the wilderness for the healings and those that were hunting him down like prey. Both groups of people are very different from each other, and yet they both ultimately reject Jesus Christ. They're both refuse to bow their knees to him. They both refuse to repent from their sins. They both refuse to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. The outline for this morning is two different ways to expel Jesus, two different ways to reject Jesus. The first is to treat him like a spectacle. Treat him like a spectacle. Treat him like a good luck charm. Treat him like a genie in a bottle. Treat him like a healer. That's the way you hate him by honoring him. The first group that we see doing that is the end of Mark 6, those that are in need. I mean, Mark uses some, some pretty over-the-top language here. Wherever Jesus went, people immediately recognized him, verse 40, 54 says. Verse 55 says they ran around the whole country and they begin to carry here and there on their pallets those who are sick to the place where he heard that he was. I mean, it's this chaotic scene that unfolds over these last few weeks of his 
Jewish ministry, this chaotic scene where the word of what's happening spreads all over Israel. Israel's not that big, 90 miles from top to bottom. Word of it spreads all over the place and people begin carrying sick people from all over the country on their pallets. Everybody who's sick in the whole country is being brought to Jesus here. They're finding him out in the wilderness. They're finding him on this north side of the lake. They're they're seeking him and everybody is flooding to him so that he can heal everybody's diseases. I mean, this image of people being carried to him on pallets is extreme. Verse 56, wherever he entered cities or a countryside even, they were laying sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. As many as touch it were made, were cured, made clean. This is such an image of the lady, remember, in the issue of blood who came to Jesus earlier and in faith laid hold of his coat and was, was healed. But we know, Jesus tells us that what she did was in faith. What these people are doing is not in faith. They're not recognizing him as the Messiah. They're recognizing him as a healer and they want to be healed from their diseases. So they're flooding to him from everywhere they're coming to him. It shows you how close they came with their feet, yet how far away they remained in their hearts. They were unwilling to forsake their own lives and follow him. They were willing to pack everything up and follow him into the wilderness to get healed, but they weren't willing to turn from their sins and give their lives to the Messiah. John lets us know that they just wanted the food. They were so impressed by the feeding of the 20,000, they came to him wanting food. And as soon as Jesus told them, I'm not going to give you any more food, do you remember what they did? They left. They left. You're not going to feed us? You're not going to give us miracles? We're out of here. And Jesus turns to, this is John chapter 6, and Jesus turns to Peter and says, are you going to leave too? Remember Peter's excellent reply? Where else could we go? You alone have the words of life. But the masses weren't after the words of life. They were after the healings and the food. This is another way of saying it. They honored him without humbling themselves. That's how you can reject Jesus. You can honor him without turning from your sin. You can honor him without humbling yourself. Listen, these people viewed healings as an end in and of itself. They wanted to see the healings because they thought that's what the show was about. They were groupies and they were there for the ride. But they didn't want to turn from their sin. They thought the healings was all he had to offer. The reality is this, the healings are a crossroad. The healings are a fork. When you see the healings, you can either see the power of your creator in action and turn from your sins and give your life to him, or you can follow along looking for the next sign and the next show. And that's what the people did. I hope you see the tragedy of this. The closer Jesus drew to his people, the more it was revealed that their hearts rejected him. This is how he describes this rejection in John chapter 15. Jesus says, if I had not done among them the works which nobody else did, they would not have sin. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. Jesus took their rejection as hatred. Verse 25, but they have done this to fulfill the word that's written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Why did Jesus continue to do miracle after miracle to these people if they were intent on rejecting him and ultimately murdering him. Why would he do that? It's so that when they killed him, they couldn't say it was his fault. When they finally did succeed in taking his life, they would not be able to say they killed him for something that he did. Instead, as they expelled him from Israel and finally ended his life, making a martyr out of him when they took his life, they were only able to say they did this for no reason whatsoever. They hated him without a cause. Well, That leads to the second way you can drive Jesus away. You can treat him like a spectacle or you can treat him like an obstacle. And we see that as we turn to Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees viewed Jesus not as a a healer and a miracle worker to be marveled at. They viewed him as an obstacle to their own rules, their own traditions, to their own religion. Now, chapter 7 is just, chapter 7 verse 1 is one of just those verses in the scripture that just stuns you of how... Really outrageous it is, what you see that transpires here at the beginning of the chapter. To really grasp the severity of what we're going to see here, you have to understand that God is full of compassion. I mean, say what you will about God, but you cannot question his compassion. This is what the scripture reveals over and over and over again. Two weeks, or last week we looked at the Lord hiding Moses in a rock. Remember, Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. I demand to see your glory. The Lord told him, you can't see my glory and live. Nevertheless, he hid Moses in the cleft of a rock, covered his face, 
passed by and removed his hands and Moses could see the, the glory of the Lord as it had passed by. And this is how it's described in Exodus 34, verse 6. Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. And that's the words Moses kept with him the rest of his life. Whenever Moses describes God from here on out in his life, he describes God as compassionate. After Moses got a full view of the glory of God, the first words to escape Moses' mouth is that God is compassionate. The Old Testament describes God as completely compassionate, consistently compassionate, altogether compassionate. He reached out to the world before the flood in his compassion to rescue people. He made laws to protect widows and orphans to rescue them for no reason other than his compassion on them. You see his compassion most clearly with the prophets. He sent prophet after prophet to Israel to warn them of their sin, to warn them of their lack of righteousness, to offer them forgiveness of their sins. He sent them, continually sent them prophets. I mean, the Old Testament is nothing if not a list of all the prophets God sent to Israel. And what did they do with all of them? Jesus said they killed all of them, A to Z, Abel to Zechariah. There's not a single one they didn't kill, he says. Using a little hyperbole, there were a few that were able to flee Israel and go to their grave in peace. But for the most part, their lives were cut short. How did God respond? I mean, he sent a prophet out of compassion to warn them, and they killed the prophet. Some they stoned, some they sawed in two, others they just simply kicked out of Israel. And how did God respond? He sent his son. He sent his son Jesus to them. Jesus came to the world, filled with compassion. And you see that throughout his life. His life just encapsulates God's whole dealing with mankind. Compassionate act after compassionate act. Is there anybody who is sick in Israel that Jesus didn't heal? Was there anybody in need? Was there a single need that Jesus crossed paths with that he didn't meet? Was there a single affliction that he didn't comfort? Was there a single person who had a question that he didn't answer? Was there a single need that he didn't meet? No. He rained down compassion on his people. And what did they do? They treated him like the prophets. This is what's so astonishing about the start of Mark 7. You just read that Jesus spent weeks doing nothing except healing people. Healing every illness. Healing every sickness. He drove illness out of Israel. People from all over the country brought their sick to him. There was nobody left at this point. And what did they do? Their religious leaders came because they were upset about how, and you can't make this up, about how he washed his hands. I mean, it's it's like a glass of cold water in the face here. He heals all the people. And he's rebuked over hand washings. There's two specific areas the Pharisees challenge him on. And this is Mark 7, verse 1 and 2. Let's you know this is an official delegation that came. I mean, with their robes and probably banners and flags and trumpets and everything. You knew where they were. And they found Jesus. What a strange and surreal encounter this must have been. They have two reasons to tangle with Jesus. One is about hand washings and the other is traditions. Now it's tricky for us to appreciate the question about hand washings. I mean, we live in a world where it's an issue of germs, right? We've got hospitals have hand sanitizer things between all the the doors and the moms have hand sanitizing gel in their purse and our church has hand sanitizers as you walk into the church. You never know who you're going to shake hands with here. (laughs) So in our world, we think it's about germs. In the Israelite world, it's not about germs. Everything in the Jewish world was clean or unclean by definition. It was the way that they viewed the world. Some food was clean, some food was unclean. Some people were clean, some people were unclean. If you touched an unclean person, you were unclean. Some acts were clean, some acts were unclean. And this is all out of your control. Some clothes were clean, some clothes were unclean. This is not about things you can control. Sometimes there's things that you can't control that make you unclean, and then you're unclean. Israel was filled with these mikvahs, these baths that they would wash themselves in, these ritual washings to cleanse themselves. Mark was one of the, Mark and 
Uh, Mark is written to Gentile audience here, so he explains this to you. If Mark was written to Jews, he wouldn't have to explain it. But fortunately, I'm thankful as a Gentile that Mark explains what he's talking about here. They rebuke Jesus for, and his disciples for eating with impure hands. Verse 3, the Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. They had this ritual for how they washed their hands. You take the, the glass of water this way, you pour it over your fist, then you take the inside of your fist, which has not been washed, and pour it over this hand, and you take this hand, which has been washed, and pour it over your, your other hand. I mean, this is so elaborate here. And it's not just about hand washings. When they came from the marketplace, verse 4 says, they don't eat unless they cleanse themselves. There were certain marketplaces that could guarantee that the food hadn't touched anything unclean. So you didn't have to wash yourself after that. But if you shopped in like a generic marketplace, the main marketplaces where there's hustle and bustle and people everywhere, you couldn't prepare the food until you took a bath, a ritual bath, because you don't know who might have touched the food. And therefore the food might be unclean and then you touch the food, so you have to be cleansed. And it's not just that. I mean, look at the list Mark gives us. There's many other things which they (laughs) tried to preserve, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. It's this whole ordeal. The whole world was filled with this thing. All Gentiles were unclean, by the way. Don't touch a Gentile. (laughs) There's a couple examples of this to just show how silly it is. And I have several, but I'm going to give you one. They said that if you touched the middle part of the book of Daniel or the middle part of the book of Ezra, you were unclean. Why? Because those parts were written in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. And obviously Gentiles are unclean. And so here's sections of their own scriptures that were written in Aramaic. And so you'd be unclean if you touched that. I mean, it's so appalling when your traditions push out God and his word. And that leads to the second beef they had with Jesus. It wasn't just over the, the washing. It was the issue of traditions for them. Now, I don't want to bore you with an a Israelite history lesson here, but Pharisees and Sadducees, two different groups of people, often opposed to each other. <laughs> they had a common enemy in Jesus. And they, so they put aside their differences to work on killing Christ. Here's one of their main differences, though. The Sadducees believed the scripture alone was the authority. The Sadducees rejected anything supernatural. They didn't believe in angels, but they believed that the Old Testament was the authority. How you reconcile those two points is a conversation for a different time. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed that there were two different sources of tradition. The Old Testament scriptures and the oral tradition that was passed down through the generations, through them, of course, The Pharisees actually believed that Moses received two different sets of laws on the mountain. He received the Torah, the first five books of our Old Testament, the written law, and he received oral instruction from God about how to implement the written law. And that wasn't written down. Instead, it was given to the 70 leaders he chose, and that was given to the priests, and that exists, you know, thousands of years later in in the Pharisees. They're the guardians of this oral rule. And of course, that doesn't even logically make sense because the oral rules grow and grow and grow over time. They don't come from Moses. There's things that you're not allowed to do today that you were allowed to do two weeks ago and vice versa. This is the nature of their traditions. And they were opposed to Jesus because he didn't honor their traditions. And their traditions were rejecting the word of God. I mean, let's look at the language that Jesus sees, or the, they say in verse 5, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Well, Jesus rebukes them. He says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. He, that's a Greek word. He just makes it right in English. It doesn't, doesn't even get translated. Just hypocrites and becomes an English word. It's a word for an actor with a mask. It doesn't mean they weren't sincere about what they were doing. It means that they were so distant from the truth, they didn't even realize it. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. They were so fastidious about washings without realizing that their washings were rejecting God. They were so concerned. They thought, I mean, listen to how outrageous their thinking was. They thought that it was things that you could touch that would make you unclean. They didn't realize that they were unclean from the inside out. They thought it was all about what you touched and what you ate. And they were so fastidious about that. And by their fastidiousness about their food, they rejected the God who had the power to cleanse them from the inside out. This is why their hearts were, their their lips were so close to their oral tradition, but their heart is so far away from God. In vain do they worship me, God says. They teach his doctrines, the precepts of men. 
In other words, they're making this stuff up. Then Jesus says, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. That word for neglecting in Greek, it means to abolish, to tear down, to destroy. Don't picture this as harmless. They have their traditions and then they have the word of God. And they exist side by side. That's not the way this works. It never works that way. Because what happens? Eventually your traditions and the word of God contradict each other. So what happens when they contradict? Well, obviously I interpret my traditions and I'm interpreting my traditions in a way that they have more authority than scripture. That's exactly what's happening here. They tear down the word of God to erect, is the Greek word, their traditions. They abolish the word of God, destroy it with a wrecking ball and replace it with this monument to their own invented rules. You can see the sarcasm in verse 9. Jesus was saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. This is what they did. This is no different than so many religions in the world today. Oh, there's different streams of truth. The Bible and then our own traditions that we, of course, interpret and, of course, change. You know, it's sinful to eat this food this year, but it wasn't last year and it won't be next year. It's made up rules. It doesn't come from the Bible. And it's actually opposed to the Bible. Because God declares all food clean. God declares that he alone can forgive sins. And instead, said you replace that with this ritual tradition of you have to confess your sins to people and the people are the ones that forgive your sins. Do you see how you cannot believe in Jesus Christ and his gospel and those traditions of men simultaneously? They abolish the gospel. They destroy it with a wrecking ball and say that forgiveness of sins comes from people. Or that cleanliness comes from how you wash your hands instead of from the Holy Spirit in your heart. It's an abomination. And people become experts in this stuff. And that's what's happening here. And Jesus uses his favorite example. I wish he would have used the Daniel Ezra one because that's my favorite example. But he chooses his own favorite example of this, this abomination here. Verse 10. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. He's quoting the fifth commandment here. You're supposed to honor your parents. And by the way, that applies to the New Testament as well. That applies to the church. Paul says it in 1 Timothy 5. If you're a believer, you're supposed to take care of your family. If you don't care for your parents, Paul says, you're worse than an unbeliever. You're like the Pharisees. Take care of your family. Well, that's what Moses said as well. Here's how the Pharisees got around that. They invented this this system called Corbin. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corbin, that's to be given to God. Let me explain the way the system works. You have a certain amount of wealth. You can give it to the Pharisees and to the temple. You're giving it to God. How holy and noble. The Pharisees would then turn around and say, you can use this for the rest of your life under the condition that you don't give any of it away. Do you see how this is (laughs) win-win? When you die, it goes to the Pharisees. And when you live, you can't give any of it to your parents because after all, it's been dedicated to the Lord. So people were giving stuff to the temple, not to give it to God, but so that they could, didn't have to give it to other people. Their parents would be in need and they say, I would love to help you, but everything I have has been given to Corbin. So I can't help you because that would be sinning against God, of course. That's the way the commandments work. This is why Jesus over and over and over again confronts their commandments, sometimes in the most comical ways. They had part of their oral tradition is that you couldn't spit on a Saturday because you might make mud with your spit. You remember how Jesus healed the blind guy by spitting into mud and wiping it on his eyes? I mean, Jesus is going out of his way to confront this. Here's his example. You say you can't give, you can't help your parents because you gave stuff to the church. You gave stuff to the temple, sorry. You say you can't help your parents because you gave it to the temple. (laughs) <laughs> By saying that, verse 12, you no longer permit a person to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus, you invalidate the word of God by your tradition, which you handed down. In other words, you made this stuff up. And you do many other such things such as that. They ultimately end up rejecting Jesus Christ because they love their traditions so much. They got rich off of them. They got their power off of them. They kept everybody in check off of them. All of Israel feared the Pharisees because of the power they had, because they had their traditions. John 10, 32. Jesus asked them this question. I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? Why are you going to kill me? He asked the Pharisees. Was it that lame guy that I healed was the blind guy I gave his sight to? In the context of John, that's probably what they were thinking. 
No, they're going to kill him because he sets aside their traditions and they get rich off of their traditions. Their identity is wrapped up in their traditions. And here comes Jesus saying those traditions are impossible to take away sins. In fact, they're hostile to God. Those traditions are a way of hating the Lord. Notice how Jesus transcends all of this. He transcends all of this. The masses try to make him king. He transcends that, simply showing them compassion. The the, uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees surround him, trying to kill him, and he escapes from there, leaving the country. And when he comes back, he's able to hold them at bay until he's done all the Father sent him to do. This is the majesty and the wisdom of our Lord. Kaylee and Hewitson were both expelled from Madeira, never to return. Let me tell you how their lives ended. They both joined up with that vessel that was heading to Trinidad. (laughs) All the believers from the Bible, all the believers from their island banished, headed to Trinidad, they joined them. They went to Trinidad and started churches in Trinidad. The largest Catholic country in the world is Brazil. From Trinidad, these Portuguese speakers sent missionaries to Brazil. And the gospel spread like wildfire across the country. See the short-sightedness of what happened so the Catholic Church did to them? They were confined on this tiny little island. Nobody would know about them, just ignore them. And instead, by throwing them out, making martyrs of their friends, throwing them out and banishing them to Trinidad, they injected the gospel into the largest Catholic nation in the world. And there's a strong Protestant presence there to this day. This is what happens to our Lord. Driven out of Israel by these people. Rejected by the masses who wanted the show, rejected by the leaders who wanted their traditions. And when he comes back, they put him to death. And through killing him, they make an atonement for sins. Through killing him, they make possible that we can have our sins forgiven. It's my earnest prayer that if there is anybody here today whose life is enshackled to man-made religion, who thinks that forgiveness of sins comes from confessing sins to this person or that person and doing this or saying that, who thinks that food is what defiles you. Even if there's anybody here who thinks that baptism is what saves you, I hope you see that those are traditions. And when you hold them in that way, you abolish the gospel. When you hold them that way, you tear down the commandments of God. And your heart gets closed to the truth. And you reject forgiveness by faith alone in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. Don't reject Jesus in that way. If you're here today and you're here because you think Jesus will make your life better, you're rejecting him. He's a spectacle to you. He's something that that you want from him. He's the slot machine. (laughs) That's rejecting him. He doesn't come that way. He doesn't come as a spectacle. He doesn't come as an obstacle to your traditions. He comes as one who obliterates your expectations and one who tears down your traditions. And he replaces them with a simple offer that you can be forgiven of your sins by repentance and belief in his death and resurrection. Lord, we're thankful for the gospel that you came to fulfill the law, that you came to cleanse us from the inside out. Lord, keep us from making traditions that bar you at the door. Help us see the simplicity of faith in Christ. May that salvation be experienced by everybody who's here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.